we've come into your house this morning to sing your praises, to lift you up. We've come from all different kinds of situations in our, our lives. Some have had really good weeks, thank you, Lord. Some have had really challenging weeks. Would you help them, Lord? In, in from whatever situation that we found ourselves, Lord, you have walked with us. Promise never to abandon us, never to forsake us. Thank you for that, Father. And this morning we would ask that your spirit would speak to our hearts, that you would draw us to yourself, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to be more like you, and that you would work within this service to touch the hearts of those that have gathered together in your name. So we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We pray for your presence. We give you praise for your grace. And in all this, we'll give you thanks. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people together said, Amen. so good to be in God's presence. And he's here today. You know that, don't you? I sense and I feel it. We have a special song this morning that the teenagers are going to help us to get the message across to you today. And hopefully the words that we sing will be expressed to you in a way that you'll get it you'll get the message that in and out of all the situations that we have in our world today guess what god's the answer to that listen as we sing
you, choir. Thank you, teens, for joining with us in that. We're going to worship our Lord by bringing to him his tithes and our offerings. Let's give him praise together. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Help us to remember that there are those that are not so blessed. Help us to trust you and help us to use what you entrust to us to make a positive difference in the lives of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was guilty with nothing to say And they were coming to take me away But then a voice from heaven was heard that said And take me instead And I should have been crucified Oh, I should have suffered and died I should have hung on that cross in disgrace but Jesus God's son took my place the crown of thorns the spear deep in his side and the pain that should have been mine Rusty nails that were meant for me Yet Christ took them and let me go free And I should have been crucified Oh, I should have suffered and I, I should have hung on that cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Yes, Jesus, God's Son, took my place. have your Bibles, would you turn with us to the book of Daniel, the fourth chapter? Now, that's not what it says in your bulletin, is it? No, it's not. But we're going to look at Daniel, the fourth chapter, starting in verse 29. I want to tell you a little bit about um, what happens before this passage of Scripture. For this passage of Scripture, King Nebuchadnezzar, he ruled over Babylon. He was powerful. He was one of the most feared kings around. The other nations feared his nation. He had accomplished so much and we come to a passage where he's standing back and looking at all the success he had. Stand with me. Daniel chapter 4, beginning at verse 29. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. 
The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kings of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a strange situation that we read about in Scripture, but it addresses a continuing concern that is present for all generations of people. The issue of pride. In a um, National Public Radio interview, David Brooks observes how we different, or how differently we deal with our own successes. And he compares two situations. The first took place right at the conclusion of war, war, World War II. The day after Japan surrendered and World War II ended, singer Bing Crosby appeared on a radio program and he came with these words. Well, it looks like this is it. What can you say at a time like this? You can't just throw your hat into the air. That's for a run-of-the-mill holiday. I guess all anybody can do is thank God it's over. He says, I was really struck at this supreme moment of American triumph and that the fact that in this time that they weren't beating their chests, they weren't super proud of themselves, they were deeply humble. And I found that so beautiful and so moving. And I thought there's really something to admire, admire in that culture. Shortly after studying about this, I was watching a pro football game. I observed something very different. Quarterback threw a short pass to a wide receiver who was tackled almost immediately for a two-yard gain. One, two. The defensive player did what all professional athletes do these days in moments of personal accomplishment. He did a self-puffing victory dance as the camera lingered. And it occurred to me that I had just watched more self-celebration after stopping a two-yard gain than I'd heard after the United States won World War II. Doesn't that pretty much describe our culture today, though? When we watch a sporting event today, of just about any kind, we see a lot of celebrations of personal victories. I don't know, I guess celebrating our accomplishments are kind of fun at times. But what about the issue of us getting caught up with ourselves so much? How should we respond to our life's victories? I hope that you have many. I hope that you have great opportunities for, for feeling good about what you've accomplished. But Nebuchadnezzar is not lifted up for us as an example to follow. He looked around at all that he had accomplished, 
And he said, I am the greatest. He'd conquered the entire civilized world. He'd made slaves of his enemies. He'd built beautiful cities. He was the king of Babylon. Yet danger comes whenever we get drunk on our own greatness. It's a danger of pride. It says in Daniel 4, 29, the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. He said, is this not the great Babylon I have built? That I have built as a royal palace Residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. He had a pretty high opinion of his own accomplishments and power and greatness. He'd become consumed with his own grandeur. What did pride do to Nebuchadnezzar? Well, if we follow the story, we find out that it it caused this man to get so wrapped up in his own accomplishments that that's all he could see. It caused him to leave God out of his life. He thought he could get along in life without God. That's a dangerous place to be for any of us. The height of arrogance is to believe that we don't need him. Pride caused this man to ignore God's attempts to talk with him. And it caused this man to lose all that he had worked for. If we look at Scripture closely, we find out that because of his pride, he lost his sanity. He lost his position. He lost his power. He lost his privileges. He lost his glory. He lost his authority. Pride cost Nebuchadnezzar everything. So let's stop for just a moment and ask ourselves, what can we do to avoid the problem of pride? I'm going to suggest to you three things. First of all, if we find ourselves going in the wrong direction, turn around. Realize that there can be a problem with excessive pride. Nebuchadnezzar was going the wrong way. His practices were destroying him and his pride was eating him up. He was suffering from idolatry. Everything he said was I this and I that and, and on and on he just was consumed with himself. I've built a great kingdom, I've built a great city, I've built a great palace. I am mighty and powerful. I am a glorious king. He was so busy looking down on the people around him that he could not see the one that was above him. Being preoccupied with our own accomplishments prevents us from seeing anything or anyone else, including God. Whenever we grab for ourselves the glory that's due to God alone, we become enslaved by our own arrogance, and we need a new direction. Through Nebuchadnezzar, God warns us to turn around. He says in verse 27, accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed, it may be then that your prosperity will continue. God is never impressed by our high opinion of ourselves. But the king ignored God's warning. He ignored it and it cost him plenty. What will we do when God warns us? As he says in the New Testament, everyone who exalts himself 
will be humbled to avoid pride's problems humble yourself by giving God the place he deserves the first place if you're going in the wrong direction turn around secondly don't get too busy for God often Scripture emphasizes a point, and it does so through repetition. Um, In verse 17, we read these words. The Most High, speaking of God, the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of men. But then it says those exact same words, not only in verse 17, but in verse 25 and verse 32. If if you want a simple translation of what that's saying, it's this. God rules your life and mine. You may not acknowledge it. I may not acknowledge it. But it doesn't change the fact he's the one that's in charge. If you're here today, you have sufficient health to do so that is given you by God. If you can follow my words, you have sufficient intelligence that allows you to do so, that has been given you by God. If you're in your right mind, you have sanity that is given you by the hand of Almighty God. The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. If we have any good thing, it's because God has allowed us to have it. God rules your life and mine. But this king did not acknowledge God as the Lord of his life. He did the very thing that so many of us do, he got too busy for God. We don't have to be king to get too busy for God. We can be a student and get too busy for God. We can be a parent and get too busy for God. We can get immersed in our work and get too busy for God. was a Park Avenue physician who, after examining this patient that was obviously stressed out, a guy who had already amassed $10 million but was eagerly seeking many more, he said, I give you this advice. I want you from this moment on to work and scheme only six hours a day instead of 16. And I want you to promise me that three days a week you'll drive to the cemetery. And the guy said, what? The cemetery? What for? He said, I want you to just look around and meet some of the men you're going to have to compete with to be the richest fool there. (laughs) We don't have to be king to get too busy for God. You know, we can be retired and be too busy for God. I'm struck by how many people that are retired <clears throat> that say words something like this to me. I don't know how I ever worked. I don't know how I had time to do it. I'm so busy now. Folks, no matter what point in life that we're at. It's a matter of priority. It's a matter of putting God first, giving him the place that he deserves. When we get too busy for God, we are too busy. It's a symptom of pride. It's saying, I can get along without you, God. So I suggest this. 
make regular appointments with him. Make a regular appointment with God weekly in public worship. I'm glad you're here today. Make a regular appointment with God daily in personal worship. Personal worship includes Bible reading. It includes a time of of prayer. And make a regular appointment with God to give yourself in service. You see, if we consume all of our energies just on ourselves, that's an ultimate statement of pride, isn't it? But if we give ourselves to others, we're saying there's something more important than just ourselves. Do something for someone for which you expect to get nothing in return. Don't get too busy for God. And third, when God speaks, listen and do what he says. Daniel 4.27 it says, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. God came to Nebuchadnezzar and he warned him to change. He gave him a chance to change. And had the king accepted that opportunity, had he turned away from his pride and acknowledged God, he could have avoided so much heartache. Could be that today God is warning some of us. You're headed the wrong direction. You're trying to build your own kingdom apart from me. And it didn't work back then, and it still doesn't work today. I'm so busy, too busy. And if those are your words and your life is just full of activity and you've forgotten me, you've forgotten that which is most important, God says, turn around. He says, make time for me. Do it now before the heartache comes. I like Max Licato's words. He says it's a prophetic picture of the final day. It's mentioned in the Gospels. It says there that at that time, many will say to me, Jesus is speaking, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform mighty miracles? says it's astounding what Jesus is saying to us he says people are standing before God and they're bragging about themselves the great trumpet is sounded and they're still tooting their own horns rather than singing his praises they're singing their own praises rather than worshiping God They're reading their resumes. When they should be speechless, they speak. In the very aura of the king, they boast of themselves. What is worse, their arrogance or their blindness? He says, you don't impress the officials at NASA with a paper airplane. You don't base about your You don't boast about your crayon drawings in the presence of Picasso. And you don't claim equality with Einstein because you can write H2O. You don't boast about your goodness in the presence of the all-holy, perfect God. Because that scripture ends with Jesus saying, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. 
Pride. Pride. Jesus says it this way also. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. I guess if we humble ourselves, God won't have to do it for us. Sounds like a wiser way to live. I am concerned about some of the patterns that we see evidence before us. You turn on television, we see athletes proclaiming their greatness. We see politicians telling us that they have all the answers. We see a lot of people that say they know the way. But we don't see a lot of people talking about how much we need God. And I'm thinking that we might need to do a U-turn and change direction. Father, this message is not just about a king back there and then. It's a message about each of us. For, Lord, we're all tempted to celebrate our victories and to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the wisdom to see ourselves and to evaluate ourselves soberly, to recognize that apart from your grace and apart from your goodness, that we, we just barely exist. So, Lord, help us to see through your eyes to value through your eyes, to appreciate the blessings and benefits we've been given, and then to give you glory for all that you have brought our way that is good and worthy. So we thank you, Lord, and we love you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Father, as you have blessed us with your grace, help us to graciously love those around us and to help them to carry their load, not only on their own strength, but with our help. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.